It's not an easy career for anyone. When you choose your career, your family will suffer. You choose your family, your career will suffer, you remain behind. For you to survive or even uh, stand out in any way, there's a certain degree of confidence that you, you need to have. From here, the way we we'll move, we we'll move in a single file. Officers will lead. training if one had to define that um, it's quite hard military training is, is it's very hard it works on your physical your mental stabilities your you know you you really have to be physically fit to to undergo training I would actually say training was designed for men. After I kind of Amy Natasha Mbembe, I um, I joined the the Zambia Army in 2005. I come from a, a military home. My father was director of finance, so for me, joining has been being closer to my dad. You know, wanting to just follow the, the rules that uh, were laid out in, in, in the beginning. You need to feed your mind. If your mind is not set, then you might not even make it to training because then it's, it's, it's like I said, Mitchell, it is, it is hard. It is hard. We underwent so many things like obstacle crossing, um, going hungry, you know, for days, for hours, long hours, walking from Kawe. Um, to Ndola, Luansha, on foot. From Officer Kaget training, we are thrown into the field doing the same things. There is no segregation during training. There is nothing like, now here the females will do this, the males will do this. So from there, that is where I took it upon myself to say I can do anything. I will not close down myself to say, okay, I am a nurse, I'll just concentrate on doing nursing and forget about the military part. Right from the word go, I said I would open up myself for any opportunity militarily. And that is what I did. I joined the army in 1993. Uh, on 23rd February, to be specific, that's when I was attested. And that time I was a student nurse at UTH. I still had the six months of training. So I became an officer cadet as a student nurse. So when I finished my nurse training at UTH, I straight away came to the military. Meaning I've never worked for Ministry of Health. 
was the Ministry of Defence took over sponsorship six months before I completed training. The, when we just went to Miltes, we were about 64. And that, out of that number, we were only eight females. We were combined with the male officer cadets in Tech 14. So then you can imagine you find these male of cadets who've trained and they've become literary machines because they were in the last phase of their training. Mm -hmm. Then they take us and we are joined with this team. Of course we had our own fears, we had our own perceptions, but what came out was wonderful because they were very nice, most of them were very nice. If one of us got tired they were ready to assist and pull along so that no one was left behind. When I joined the military, fine, my sister was there and she would tell me, it is hard, it is hard. But I never expected the hardness I found coming from the luxury of everything. You know, you don't sweep, you don't do what, then you are, now you are brought into this training where your day has to start by 04, 03, your day starts. And then maybe you have to come and sleep at 03. But I think after a month or so, I adjusted and I started loving my training. Through and through, I loved my training. I am Colonel Muzukan Jinamuawa. I am the Deputy Director General, I'm Illegal Services Branch. And uh, I am a wife, I'm a mother. I'm a Christian, of course, that comes number one. And I, I like to think that I'm a creative person as well. Uh, of course, I'm a legal practitioner. Uh, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. I think I've always just believed in the cause of justice and equality and things of that nature. That's what made me, you know, pursue a career in law. It's not an easy career for anyone, male or female. It has its own challenges. Um, but more so for women because, you know, the environment is predominantly male. As leaders, as officers, the leadership traits are predominantly masculine. You know, if a, if a man stands up before he even opens his mouth, there's a presumption that he's intelligent, he's capable, he's fit for the task. And you come to the table and you're female, there's a presumption that is in the opposite direction. And resultantly, you find that you have to work a lot harder and your male counterparts to prove yourself, to prove your skill, prove your capabilities. So from that perspective, I think it, it, is, it is a challenge for, for females, but it is certainly not something that is insurmountable. I think that we have come a long way as women in the military, in, in Zambia specifically. Of course, we're not where we would like to be, but I think that there are certain strides that have been made to see that there are more, there's more inclusion in a system such as ours, but it is still a very, very challenging environment for women. At independence in 1964, the newly independent Zambian Republic was surrounded by hostile white settler regimes on five of its eight borders. Reports indicated that these hostile neighbors were drawing up plans for air strikes against guerrilla holdings in Zambia. To meet the precarious security situation surrounding the country, a plan for a system of nationwide defense was devised by Zambia's first indigenous army commander General Kingsley Chinkuli. The plan involved training the majority of Zambians, including youths and women, for national defense.
The lone female pioneer of General Chinkuli's plan was Major Louis Ito Siwale, who joined as an officer in 1972. At that time, there were neither female officers nor soldiers in the entire army. Officer Cadet Siwale, trained as the only woman with male cadets, and was commissioned as a captain in 1972. Thereafter, she was appointed Staff Captain Administration at Army Headquarters. Captain Siwale having opened the way, in September 1974, a large intake of females was enlisted for military training as officer cadets at the military training establishment of Zambia based at Kohima Barracks in Kabwe. These cadets were single, between 18 and 25 years of age and had O-level education standard while others had specialized qualifications such as registered nursing, accounts, secretarial and journalism. However, for the most part of the post-independence period, despite undergoing the same training, women were not posted to fighting corps or deployed in the field on operation. You know, I sat back and I looked at the hypocrisy, mm -hmm. you know? And I was saying, what's all this about, you know? All I could do was freeze, salute, thank you very much, sir. And I walked out frustrated. Is this the leadership? Mm -hmm. You know? Because as a leader, you are supposed to identify potential, mm -hmm. maximize that potential, and put the officers and soldiers in the right place so that they can flow according to the God-given potential. After cadet training, we had no choice. Our roles were predetermined and they were all admin roles. We had three nurses who had worked before and they qualified, they went straight to the medical corps. Some of us went to the pay corps, others went to ordnance, others went to transport. We had one who went to transport, yes. We had one who went to provost, but the rest of us were channeled to non-combat roles. That's where we went. The point I'm trying to drive home here is be who you are, apply yourself, and let God do what he knows best. It can be done through more sensitization. Given a chance, you go to Miotes when there's officer cadet training to go and talk to the, the female cadets to say your training um, is a basis for you to grow militarily. Do not come out of here then change your mind to say, oh, I'm a female. This I cannot do. This I think this is for men. I think that is what we've been thinking. Most of the women have been thinking. After uh, cadet training, then we start thinking, oh, let me just go and become the non-combat uh, uh, roles. That is where, as females, we've been rushing to. Apart from us who come in as uh, medical personnel, we are already nurses. There are some who are not in the medical corps who come to the corps after they train as cadets because they do not want to go into the combat roles, so to speak. So they feel, I think if I go to medical, then it will save me from being deployed as a, a combatant, which I feel should not be our thinking. As military personnel, we should be 
um, broad-minded. We shouldn't narrow our thinking to just being females, to our gender. Um, and we should not allow the men to look down upon us. When we were 15, we thought that the ladies were 15. And at that time, um, they wanted the secretaries, you know, so because they, they were less secretaries in the army. So two of us were from the IT background, and then uh, 13 were from the secretarial background. When we went for the last exercise, I was a platoon commander. So as a platoon commander, I have to do what the platoon commander does, regardless of gender. So each and every one of us who went for that exercise, whichever exercise, I think we had three exercises, we did all the appointments, we were given mortar, you carry that heavy thing, eh? you have to carry it whether you like it or not. So when you look at uh, the way we were able to carry out uh, the male-dominated uh, appointments, it's because you know we're built enough, eh? when you go for training, you are still weak, you know, you are still weak, you, are, you think you are feminine, no, I can't do this and whatever. But as you go on training, you will know that if I don't do this, I'm going to fail. And if I fail, I'm going to go back home. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So you build up from that. And then eventually you become interested. You know, it becomes an interest in this challenge, you know. You have to challenge the, the male counterpart. You should ask the people that I trained with myself. I was able to run and leave them behind. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So it becomes like you are competing amongst them your male counterparts. So like that, you, it, it becomes interesting, very interesting. Hey, when I'm see how you, hey, you know, sir, I, hey, you are my you, 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 you see yes, what I'm talking yes. about, yes. So it was a challenge and it was enjoyable, you know, because you, 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 you want to prove your point. So as you are trying to prove your point, you are also perfecting your, your career path. In combat roles, when women are deployed, they make a difference. The only thing that are supposed to do is they must be, they must, the infrastructure now should change. Things are supposed to be gender sensitive. Equal rights should be there. Equal. If I get two, you get two. Deployment is same. Competence. That is the primary thing. Competence. The person is competent, deploy as such. Deploy as such. Zambia has been sending troops to participate in UN operations and MINUSCA in the Central African Republic since 2015. Initially, the first contingent of troops to MINUSCA only had two females, which led to a number of challenges especially in dealing with women and children-related issues in the operation area. Arising from the difficulties faced, Command at Headquarters Zambia Army authorized deployment of more women in the second contingent to make the deployment more robust and effective. Following the initiative by command, Zambia essentially created a first female engagement team in 2016. Since then, Zambia's female engagement teams have been recognized and praised internationally and have greatly helped in serving and uplifting the lives of the people of the Central African Republic and especially those of women and children. My name is Major Florence Mwakashka. Currently, I'm a deployed at a Farms Directorate as Deputy Director. I was uh, in a Central African Republic 2018 to 2019. Firstly, what I would say is that I was deployed in car as a catering officer. Being the senior most, I was also given the appointment of matron for the females uh, for Zambati 4. When I saw 
the condition of women and some of the gaps that were there, especially with consideration of uh, the culture of uh, the people of Ka, where interaction between a woman and a man becomes a little bit uh, difficult. We thought it would be better if we can push forward with the female engagement activities so that we bridge that gap, which the men could not do. Women are very, very important. It cannot be overemphasized. Why? Because, you know, traditions differ. For example, I think most of uh, these areas where we have gone for operations, I've been to, to Sudan before. And in Sudan, equally, you realize that uh, their tradition there would not really allow women to interact freely. There are women interacting freely with men. But when you are in war, really, there are so many things that you want from the population. And whatever you require may not just come from the men. Maybe at times it can be help, uh, helpful to reach out to the women because usually women are so affected in war. Captain Belinda Msonga Zimba. I'm currently working at the Defense Corps of Health Sciences as a senior clinical instructor. I joined the Army in uh, 20, 2012, that is after working as a registered nurse midwife for 15 years under the Ministry of Health. But I joined the regular training, so I trained for a year and two months. And wasn't it a challenge? Because I joined the Army at the age of 35, and my intake mates were 26 and below. So you can imagine the pressure of the physical aspect of it. I ended up uh, getting a nickname from there, so I was famously known as Mama Z, because no one wanted to quit if I was still running. So no one quit that training because they saw this 35-year-old running and trying very hard. That time I was a mother of two. So you can imagine that uh, physical challenge. So that is how I trained in 2012. And amazingly, they would, they would run. My intake mates would do the physical aspect, they would run, I would run behind. But when it came to books, I had a better brain. <laughs> I was able to catch up with the, the theoretical aspect of it, and I was commissioned as a junior under officer. I've also been deployed in the mission in Central African Republic, that was 20, 2020. I was deployed there as a nursing officer at company level, that is Alpha Company. And I was deployed with commandos. Yeah, it was good people to live with because I ended up doing a lot of tar rolling just before lunch. <laughs> we should be given a voice, we should be given a voice. Such that if there are those uh, decision making situations, can a woman be present? Yes. We also have our shortcomings and all, but we're equal to the task. As a female engagement team, we had uh, a mandate that we had to achieve. That is to collect information from the local women, to integrate the women and the children that have been devastated during the times of conflict. And to achieve this, we did not focus only in Birao, where we were centered, but all around the country, we did a lot of patrols, long-range and short-range patrols. We focused so much on the children and the women because they are the ones that are mostly affected during this conflict. I am Captain Sharon Namchimba. I was Fed Commander from 2020 to 2021 in Central African Republic. I was privileged to command this specialized team, which has a specific role in the mission area. This team, it's not everybody that belongs to this team. It's women that have been trained to do specific roles. That's why female engagement team it's a power tool that the commander that is on the ground is supposed to use. Because where men cannot reach, women are supposed to do that. And that's why the Zambian Battalion has deployed women in Central Africa. When we go there, you don't go there to change the culture of the people that are there, no. You have to embrace their culture. How do you embrace their culture when you have to also protect them? 
Women there are used as couriers to transport weapons and any substances that are illegal. So their culture is that you cannot search a woman. Now if we had to deploy men on their own, how do you search such women? It's, it's a two sides of a coin. There's a culture that they have to preserve, there's a peacekeeping that you have to do. So it becomes difficult when there are only men that are there. As an infantry lady officer, I would say I've reached, I've reached the, the, the top. <laughs> we just want to um, appreciate the hard work that the, the Zambian women, even just in all of the other defense forces that we're trying to do to bring this gender equality uh, across the board, because it's not easy. But uh, with time, I think we're able to prove that we can, we, we can achieve a lot of things. And um, happy 50 anniversary to all the <laughs> lady officers across the board, all defense forces. And um, let's move forward. It's still not too late. We're almost there, but not yet there. Let's push for the gender equality because we're here to win. A woman in combat, just your presence there, you have this power within you. It's motivation enough for everyone. They feel so safe. They feel so happy. They, you are a hero that will never live to tell your story. But the story is ever in you. The people that you're serving, their hearts will always remember you. They will bless you every day. It is because just your presence is power enough. So you, sometimes you don't even need to talk to them. You don't even need to, to carry your gun and do anything. Your presence is power enough. Every woman possesses power that sometimes we do not discover who we are. But once you know that there's power within you to encourage a fellow woman, to encourage a child, to encourage a boy child, you do exploits. I think that when you enter any difficult environment or any challenging environment, it's important to understand the dynamics and not to complain about the status quo, okay? And to get in there and do your part to ensure that you bring about some sort of, or you influence positive change. Uh, instead of just, you know, wanting things just because you are female, or whatever reason that is not hinged on just proving yourself and working hard so that you get yourself that seat at the table. There's nothing easy, you know. If, if it comes easy, it goes away just as easily. So even in finding myself in this very macho environment with everybody who has gone before, before someone like myself, uh, and facing whatever challenges that come my way, it's not, it's not about complaining and, you know, crying about it. It's about, okay, then what do I do about it? How do I play a role in ensuring that I have a legacy that I can look at when I'm no longer here to say that, okay, I was able to influence A, B, C, D for the better so that whoever is coming behind me will somehow find an even more accepting environment than what, what I, have, I have experienced. So you have to toughen up. You have to be tough. Uh, I have to roll with the punches sometimes because they make you stronger at the end of the day. And um, keep pushing. Yeah. <laughs>